In the last few lectures, we've talked about the civil rights movement and the struggle for um, political and social justice. We've talked about the Black Power Movement and the struggle for uh, nationalism and for our personal self-definition. And now we're going to be moving on in this lecture to the struggle for economic justice. During the Cold War, black leaders had de-emphasized economic concerns to minimize accusations of communism. Martin Luther King Jr. had initially followed in their footsteps, but the economic emphasis of black nationalist rhetoric inspired King to take a closer look at economic inequality. He traced urban violence directly to the economic disabilities that racism produced. He saw that economic inequality had a particularly damaging effect on the black community. During the 1960s, black unemployment rates were at the recession level of 10.2%, whereas the white rate of unemployment was 4.9%. The unemployment rate for blacks in 1963 was three times higher than that of uh, whites. In addition, black workers on average earned only 55% of what whites earned, and black teenagers suffered joblessness at twice the rate of white teenagers. On the right here, you have a very long-term uh, graph that shows unemployment rates by race. And I want to point out to you that there is um, this uh, persistent line over the other line that the African-American unemployment rate is uh, often twice as high as the unemployment rate for, uh, for non-African Americans. Um, why was this happening? What was up with the unemployment rates in general? Well, economic conditions in the U.S. in the 1960s were beginning to be worsened by American deindustrialization. And deindustrialization just means transforming from an America that manufactures things to one that revolves around service jobs and the financial sector. In the 1960s and 1970s, African Americans continued to migrate out of the South, but the industrial jobs that had attracted earlier generations of Southern migrants to the North were no longer available. For example, Detroit lost 140,000 factory jobs between 1947 and 1963. New York lost 70,000 garment industry jobs. Chicago's meatpacking industry shrank. And the longshoremen, shipbuilding, and warehouse jobs in port cities like Oakland, Newark, Philadelphia, and Baltimore all disappeared as fewer ships were built. All right, so that's part of the reason why there is um, economic suffering and injustice in black neighborhoods. But another reason was so-called urban renewal. Urban renewal and highway development projects destroyed older urban neighborhoods, cut through communities, and displaced residents. For example, Manhattan San Juan Hill, a black and Puerto Rican neighborhood, was leveled to make way for the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. In Philadelphia, the Black Bottom neighborhood was bulldozed to make way for a science and research center attached to the University of Pennsylvania. Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood was cut off on one side by an expressway and on the other side by a public housing project. So you see here what some of the rundown housing in the urban areas that had um, experienced a lot of white flight and deindustrialization, what they look like on the right hand side of the slide and on the bottom, it explains urban renewal as slum clearance and urban redevelopment. Affordable housing was a consistent problem for African Americans. When whites moved out of the city, public housing became more available to African Americans, although it also fur further isolated them. Buildings were usually built in impoverished black neighborhoods or on marginal land, such as garbage dumps or toxic wetlands. The Robert Taylor Homes and Stateway Gardens in Chicago, Boston's Columbia Point, 
and Philadelphia's Passion Combs were all built on sites that developers could not use for anything else. This is the backdrop to Lyndon Johnson's declaration uh, upon assuming the presidency after being actually elected in 1964, that he was declaring a war on poverty. Using Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Johnson's administration established a series of programs. The Job Corps was intended to create employment opportunities for urban teenagers, Head Start programs gave poor preschoolers a, uh, an education. The Neighborhood Youth Corps gave inner city youth summer jobs. And Volunteers in Service to America was like um, an at-home version of the Peace Corps, giving youth a chance to serve underprivileged communities. It's interesting to note that in the 1960s, a lot of the um, underprivileged communities that they were showing on TV uh, were in Appalachia, in the places that we know of today um, as the former coal mining areas. There was also a lot of grinding poverty, so it was not just inner city areas that were experiencing poverty in the 1960s. Politicians who opposed Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act weakened the measure by limiting the funding and abilities of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission's job was to um, investigate instances of discrimination. Uh, so they didn't really have the financial support that they needed. So instead, black workers used the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, the NAACP, and the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund to build a body of case law that exposed the impact of institutional racism on their lives. So for example, there were seniority lists that blocked African Americans from good jobs. There were discriminatory hiring and promotion procedures, biased recruiting, segregated unions, and the use of exclusionary testing and job requirements unrelated to job performance. All right, so um, the EEOC is there, but it can't do much, so other legal avenues are being used. Related to this, in 1966, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership uh, Coalition established Operation Breadbasket in Chicago. This was a program that was designated to increase both black employment in urban businesses and the number of black owned businesses. Uh, the program recognized the need to create op economic opportunities it won jobs, the operation won jobs by boycotting certain products and businesses, and also involved conversations about developing compensatory measures to aid economic development in the black community. All right, so if there was a certain store that didn't hire African Americans or a certain product that um, was for some reason uh, harming African Americans, there would be boycotts. A. Philip Randolph, you'll remember him as the um, Sleeping Car Porters Union head, Bayard Rustin, Whitney Young, and John Lewis supported King's push for, quote, a massive program by the government of special compensatory measures and a, quote, freedom budget. Now, compensatory programs are kind of things like reparations or special loans or grants. And what they said is, these kinds of compensatory programs challenge the notion that property rights give employers and unions the right to discriminate. They insist instead on, quote, affirmative action, preferential treatment of African Americans through, for example, the use of numerical hiring goals, um, the favoring of minority-owned businesses and government contracts, that sort of thing. For 300 years, white Americans had been given preferential treatment on the basis of their color. Uh, people debated whether Johnson's war on poverty was at all effective, but one thing that's completely true about the war on poverty from an unemployment perspective is that it was helpful to college-educated black women. Because the federal government and, in fact, government uh, at the state level and at the municipal level was not supposed to be discriminating, <clears throat> 
Um, black women were hired for many of these government jobs at all levels, and this helped uh, greatly to alleviate the poverty rate in the black community. By the same token, or sort of the reverse token, as in the 1980s, um, the federal government was pared down by Ronald Reagan talking about oh, government being bloated and overblown. African American um, employed people in the civil service and elsewhere in the government disproportionately lost out. All right, moving on to the war in Vietnam. The Johnson administration was hampered in its war on poverty by the fact that it was caught up in a major conflict in Vietnam. This war had been going on, you know, in one way or another for the U.S. from the mid-1950s when the U.S. bailed out France. In 1965, President Johnson increased the number of U.S. troops already sent to Vietnam by his predecessors, and he said that this was to keep South Vietnam out of the hands of the communists. There was a belief in the State Department and in the Department of Defense in the 1960s that if any nation fell to the communists, then Soviet domination was on the way, that, you know, there was a domino effect. As a result, by the end of 1966, there were over 385,000 combat troops in Vietnam, 15% of whom were African American. In addition, 6,378 American soldiers had been killed and over 35,000 had been wounded. And these numbers would steadily increase over the duration of Johnson's administration. So African Americans are participating disproportionately uh, as draftees or inductees in this war. And they also oppose the war at the same time. Um, despite the fact that Johnson imagined Vietnam to be central to American interests in the Cold War, African Americans didn't think the conflict was worth soldiers' lives. You can see here in the top right corner, this chart shows that although African Americans made up only 12% of the population in 1966, they made up 13.4% of all inductees. Um, in some years... Uh, it was more than 16% who were the percentage of African Americans inducted into the army. Why were there more African Americans in the army than there should have been? Well, black leaders blamed institutional racism, and there was also kind of classism going on. Middle class and upper class whites had an advantage because the draft exempted students and professionals and skilled workers and uh, also people with, uh, with heel spurs. African Americans continued to face relentless discrimination in the armed services and it often got them killed. The complaints were familiar. Black soldiers were seldom recommended for promotion. Reports about them were biased. They were given the most dangerous combat assignments they were court-martialed and imprisoned at rates higher than those of white soldiers. They had higher rates of dishonorable discharges than whites and low test scores, um, often because of the educational uh, infrastructure issues that we talked about in a previous, um, a previous lecture. So African Americans didn't get the chance to do specialty and, and technical training, and so most of them were placed as infantry troops. The proportion of African Americans in combat units was reduced after the Pentagon was actually presented with the disproportionate figures of black casualties in the war. And here we see some soldiers in Vietnam holding a uh, black power uh, little banner there that they made and giving the black power salute. Muhammad Ali, who uh, was the heavyweight boxing champion of the world in 1964, uh, was drafted to fight in the war. He had been born Cassius Clay, but um, he decided to change his name to Muhammad Ali. Uh, he opposed the war on moral grounds, saying that Muslims couldn't participate in any war but a holy war. He went through a whole year of legal battles and 
eventually was convicted of draft evasion in 1967 and was sentenced to serve five years in prison and to pay a $10,000 fine. Although the Supreme Court overturned his conviction in 1971, by that time he had been stripped of his heavyweight title at the height of his career. However, he did uh, become a a hero to many African Americans who opposed the war. Civil rights leaders also increasingly became more vocal about their opposition to the war, including, you know, by the mid-1960s, Martin Luther King Jr. He was making some of the same arguments that black nationalists made. Initially, it was rooted in the war's costs. The government spent $500,000 to kill each enemy soldier, but only $35 to feed each poor American. This is called the guns versus butter trade-off or dilemma. And um, King really felt as though the government was uh, spending too much money on the military. But then in 1967, he gave a speech at Riverside Church in New York City in which he said the war was an enemy of the poor, both black and white. He argued black soldiers should not have to fight for freedoms abroad that they didn't have at home. He compared U.S. actions in Vietnam to Hitler's genocide and urged America to stop bombing Vietnamese citizens. King also critiqued capitalism and pronounced that, quote, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, and new systems of justice and equality are being born. We in the West must support these revolutions. So he was really becoming uh, much more radical uh, in terms of the uh, political spectrum at this point. Months after he delivered his Riverside Church speech, he announced that he was starting a poor people's campaign to bring 1,500 protesters to Washington in 1968 to demand an economic bill of rights. King called for a $30 billion anti-poverty package that was committed to full employment, guaranteed annual income. So if you've ever heard of a basic income guarantee, um, Martin Luther King was talking about that in 1968, and increased housing for the poor. Now, at the same time that all this was going on, um, black radical activism, uh, urban activism had ratcheted up during the late 1960s. Black auto workers, for example, had joined in something called the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement. Welfare reformers beginning in, or in 1964 marched on state houses in 25 different cities to protest the way that welfare, or at that point it was called aid to families with dependent children, was being uh, given out. They didn't like the eligibility requirements, which often required that families break up if families were going to be eligible for any payment. Um, They also wanted better food, better clothing allowances, job training programs for women, and subsidized daycare. Former welfare recipient Johnny Tillman and college professor George Wiley led the formation of the National Welfare Rights Organization, which lobbied legislatures, led protests, initiated legal suits, and demanded that the government guarantee an annual income. Tangentially, Richard Nixon came the closest to providing a uh, basic income guarantee with his uh, family assistance program in the early 1970s, the National Welfare Rights Organization was one of the groups that thoroughly opposed Nixon's plan, though, because they said that it was unrealistically a low payment to be able to support people. Johnson's War on Poverty also encouraged people in poor communities to solve their own problems. The government sponsored community action programs in most American cities, and community action programs had to have a certain number of poor people on their governing boards. They used the fact that people who lived in inner cities understood the dynamics of their communities better than outsiders, and they established things like job training, child care, social services, Head Start classes, 
housing services, welfare consultants, legal services, and health care. But they also trained people to be local activists. So you've got people who weren't previously normally very politically active, um, suddenly becoming more empowered. And this empowerment, um, when it appeared as mass action in urban areas, was written off um, by white people and by city leaders as rebellions or riots. Um, in the second half of the 1960s, violence erupted in a total of 300 cities, and some of it was more violent violence than others. For example, in 1965, a riot erupted in the Watts section of Los Angeles, during which 34 people died and $35 million worth of property was destroyed. In 1967, a Detroit riot resulted in 43 deaths, while 2,000 people were wounded and 5,000 saw their homes destroyed by fire. In total, 1960s urban violence accounted for 250 deaths, 10,000 serious injuries, and 60,000 arrests. Um, and during the, quote, long hot summer of 1967, there were riots in 159 cities, including the city of Newark, New Jersey, where my dad was in law school at that time. Uh, my parents lived pretty close by, and they said that they could see the smoke coming up from the flames in Nork that was on fire throughout the summer of 1967. Here is a, um, a shot also from the Nork riots shown, uh, showing that um, black owned businesses put signs in their windows and wrote Soul Brother on their um, display windows with soap so that they would not be attacked by the crowds. Well, when all this violence broke out, uh, many whites blamed the riots on black power rhetoric. Civil rights leaders denounced violence. Um, a presidential commission was set up called the Kerner Commission to figure out what the cause of all this violence was. Their report said these riots are reactions to poverty, to inequality, to sort of despair in urban areas. So we need to kick up the momentum on the war on poverty. But on, a, on April 4th, 1968, exactly one year after he had denounced the war in Vietnam, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on the balcony of a Memphis hotel. He had gone to Memphis as part of the Poor People's Campaign to support a black sanitation workers union. 100 cities erupted in riots that lasted for three days as news of King's death spread. In the immediate aftermath of King's assassination, Lyndon Johnson announced that he would not seek a second presidential term. And he said this in April uh, of 1968 and immediately because the, um, the Democratic um, convention was in August of that year, it, it was like, well, now we have to scramble around and see who we're going to get. Almost immediately, Robert Kennedy, who has served as attorney general under his brother's administration, threw his hat into the ring. Kennedy, like his brother, was an inspirational speaker, and he was also very publicly dedicated to both civil rights and to um, economic equality. He even said, you know, if we just had a uh, an 11, I think it was trillion, but it might have been billion, um, dollar redistribution of income, then we wouldn't have to worry about poverty ever again. Well, uh, Robert Kennedy was going around kind of scooping up delegates to the Democratic Convention until on June 5th, 1968, he was assassinated um, after a speech at a hotel, assassinated by an activist who did not like Kennedy's views on Israel. And the deaths of King and Kennedy in 1968 showed that people who advocated basic fairness were being made to really pay a terrible price. That the problem of the 20th century had really not been solved. Uh, okay, see you in the comments.